What do you think, by the way, about your boy Elon Musk? Because I know you love Tesla so much. Mm-hmm. Saying they're going to be fully self-driving in like what two weeks? He's he's been saying that for like three years. Yeah, a lot of people think he's full of shit. Yeah. A lot of people think he's just full but, of shit. But when he says stuff like that, the stock just goes up. Oh, great. Yeah. That's great. So. Good. Well, I hope when you're in your car and you're incinerated, <laughs> this, the stock price makes you feel comfortable as you and your wife are burning to death in your Tesla because this guy told you it was going to drive you home. Maybe it will one day. I don't really know, you know? Mm. Everybody's so goddamn sensitive now. So if Elon Musk hears this, uh, we're kidding, Elon. And we don't know if we're kidding yet. We'll let you know. Hopefully Ben still gets to work every day. <laughs> Everyone is so goddamn sad. You can't say anything about anybody anymore without a problem. You know? Like I made the joke about uh, Eric Weinstein and Lex Friedman. I was like, well, on the Patreon, I go, what have these guys done? They're clearly smart guys. The joke is... Is about the fact that, like, yes, they're both, you know, Lex is uh, in robotics and everything. He's a brilliant guy. And Eric Weinstein's very smart and everything. But, like, you know, the trans discussion has sucked all of the oxygen out of the room. So I'm sure these people have brilliant takes on other issues. But is it fair to say that the trans issue has been on the forefront and I'm, for one, I'm a little bored of the truck. I don't care anymore if you cut your tits off or sew a dick on. I don't care what you call yourself. It doesn't bother me if you want to become a, 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 a woman so you can beat them up in a ring. I'm almost for that. <laughs> as long as you look at them before you do it and go, you should have kept your mouth shut. <laughs> but what I'm saying is... I'm not saying I'm kidding. They're clearly very intelligent people. But, like, why is everyone now a guru? Why do people jump out of their lane and they become a guru for every issue in life? No one has any type of specialization anymore. If people, I mean, everybody is just like, f- like, firing wildly, going, yeah. I, I'm I'm a scientist, or I'm this, or I'm that, and also I know everything about everything. I should be your go-to for every question you have about any issue that could ever come up now or in the future. That's where I get confused. It's not that they're not smart. It's not that they're not they don't have valuable things to say. I just get confused as to how everybody immediately becomes a guru. Overnight, people just become, they just decide, I, uh, you got problems? I'll tell you what it is. What are we doing today? Race? Gender? Sexuality? Vaccines? What do we got? Put it on the whiteboard. I got the answer. I got the answer. Bring it on. Weather? War? Religion? What's on the grill today? Sizzle it up. (laughs) Salt and pepper it. It's ready to go. I don't have to let anything marinate. I'm ready to go. It's just fascinating. That's all. That's all I'm ever saying. I love everyone and support them. I'm just curious as to how everybody uh, is an expert in every issue that could ever arise from any discipline ever. That's interesting to me. That's all. And maybe that's the case. Maybe it's the case that there are seven intelligent people and the rest of the world are hacks and shills. I don't know. That's YouTube. You go on YouTube. Basically, the premise of of, of YouTube is I get it. And everyone else that's ever lived or studied this issue is either a bad faith actor, hack, shill, has been bought off, is a liar, is being blackmailed, and I have figured it out, and nobody else has. That's all. It's curious to me. It's curious. And then, if you make jokes, people get angry at you. The people, by the way, who defend jokes. 
defend comedy. And they always go out and go, comedy is being neutered by the PC police. And then you make jokes about them and they go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, mm, eh, actually, ah, uh, we don't like that. You go, well, wait a minute. How, I don't understand. I thought comedians were vital. Sort. I thought this was a vital activity. What? And they go, well, yeah, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. People get angry at you. The same. The people get angry at you for kidding around. And you go, yeah, it's a joke. I'm a comedian. You shouldn't take me seriously. No one should. It's a comedy podcast. Maybe I say some interesting things. Maybe I'm right about some of what I say, but uh, it's a goof. I look at shit that may or may not be bullshit, and I call it out, and it may not be bullshit, and it may be bullshit. But that's where a lot of my comedy comes from. Uh, okay. And then the people that are like, all these people that are like, you know, the co comedians are being, you know, there's a, the backlash now to the backlash, as a smarter friend of mine has said, is becoming as sanctimonious as the woke people. The other side of the woke people, they're, they are now as boring as the woke, you know, used to watch the woke people and go, Jesus Christ, shut up. And now the other side, you're like, Jesus Christ, you should also shut up. Should we just get academics completely out of public life? Should we just exile academics? I don't know. But it's just this sanctimonious. All the time. The left is waging a war on your private choices. They want you to be completely. And then if you you make a few, and they're like, and they always love comedy. All these people, because the left is insane, and the woke people do go after comedy, and they do take people's jobs. And I understand that. So the people that recognize that, I applaud. And then you go, yeah, but you're also a little goofy. And then they go, well, I well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're giving ammunition to the other side. Somebody said that to me. They go, well, when you make fun of the, those people whom you agree with, I go, yeah, I agree with a lot of them. But they go, but yeah, but if you make fun of them, you give ammunition to the other side. And I go, but that's the exact argument that leftists, or not leftists per se, but you know, liberal or whatever you want to call them, woke social justice warriors, that's the same argument that they used. They said, you can't make a joke about race because you're a racist and you're giving ammunition to racists. So if I make a joke about Barry White or whoever the fuck I'm talking about, Eric Weinstein or whatever, I'm giving ammunition to the lunatics who think that gender is, you know, created, uh, that Bill Maher created gender or whatever, <laughs> whatever these fucking lunatics in San Francisco believe. I'm giving ammunition to them because I've made a joke about someone that disagrees with them. It's the same SJW playbook. It's the same exact thing. It's actually the same exact thing. It's we like comedy when it fits in the, the box of what we would like it to. And uh, it doesn't really matter. It's just comedy, except if it's directed at us, it's a powerful force that must be vanquished. It's a powerful force that must be vanquished unless it is exactly what we want it to be. Make fun of us in the way that you want us to be made fun of, please. Thank you. Thank you. They love roasts. All these, uh, you know, the tech people, the people on Clubhouse or any of these guys I, I talk to, they all like, yeah, comedy's about roasting. No, it's not. Roasting, for the most part, is pretty stupid. There are some people that are brilliant at it. Uh, Geraldo and Jeff Frost, whatever. You go, you go back throughout history. It's important. It's like an important comedic skill. You should every good comic should have a little bit of it, but it's boring. It's it's you, you know it's it's very formulaic. There's nothing there. You're fat. You're gay. You're bald. You're black. You're the. There's nothing there, dummies. But some of the most successful people in the world, they love roasting because God forbid a comedian say anything that makes them think and they have some existential moment. So they just like, can you call him a faggot, please? Because I don't know. <laughs> so when you meet a lot of these people that are, that are successful, they think the comedian's job's like, <laughs> roast them. Yo, thrash them. <laughs> you go trash that guy. Who can't, like... Is there anything more boring than that, by the way? Is there anything more boring than watching people just trade insults back and forth? What level? I mean, I just don't understand 
But that's what a lot of very smart, very successful people love. They love watching people insult each other. That is their idea of comedy. That's what they think it is. It's just insult. Pick, look at a brown guy. Say he's a terrorist. That's comedy. You know? It, it's really crazy, but I don't want to get in the weeds over this. And then everybody goes, then everybody's response is like, why don't I just come on the show and we'll hash it out? And it's like, no, I don't, I don't want to do the th- five hours of a lecture. I don't want to do it. I respect you. I think you're smart. But at the end of the day, it's like, I'm so deeply suspicious of people who level accusations at people and then they themselves exhibit that behavior. It's like the QAnon people that were going away for child porn. Right. That wasn't shocking because they spent 18 hours a day thinking about child porn. So it's also not shocking to me that if you call people snowflakes for years and years and years and then somebody says something about you and then you actually become the snowflake. Because it's like, oh, you are intimately acquainted with the idea of what a snowflake is because you are exhibiting those characteristics yourself. You know? It's one or the other, folks. Either comedy doesn't matter and it's fun and you can like it or not and take from it what you want and leave the rest, or it's an important social force that everyone needs to govern. Pick one. Please pick one. Can't be everything. Can't be everything. It can't be like, hey, it's just a joke, and then when it's about something you don't like, you go, whoa, wait a minute. I saw that after the White House Correspondents' Dinner with with Michelle Wolf when she did that, and then everybody came in, all the same people that were like, these leftists are snowflakes, and Michelle made a few jokes about Trump, and these people lost their goddamn mind. I'm just learning. I'm just learning. (laughs) That's all I'm doing here. Get mad at me. I'm insignificant. I don't matter. Yeah, I have an audience because we have fun and we say funny stuff and some of it makes a lot of sense. That's not my fault. That's not my fault. You know, when I make fun of Gary Vee, I don't hate Gary Vee. He's probably a really good guy. I'm sure he's helped people. But the advice he gives is very vague and general. It's uh, ridiculous. The words he uses and the, er, the way he arranges them is ridiculous. So for somebody to not call that out is uh, that I wouldn't be doing my job. If I pulled up Gary V quotes and read them aloud and said, now that I've told you these things, Go start a business. You would look at me like I was on. I was smoking rock cocaine, smoking crack. You'd go, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, you know, kindness is speed and empathy is uh, marketing is queen and content is king and, you know, gratitude is whatever. Go, go do it now. Yeah, gratitude is, uh, gratitude is speed. What? Whatever he's saying. But I'm sure he's a smart guy, and I'm sure he said things that have value to certain people. But it's funny imagining people trying to fashion a sense of what the hell is going on in their life and in their business from the quotes that dribble out of his mouth. It's, you know? Which is why, like, you can go to dinner with people, and you can become friends with people. And I talked to a big comedian once who was like, Jeff Bezos invited me to like his summer camp once. And the big comedian was like, yeah, I didn't want to go. Because you start to realize as a comic, you're not supposed to be that tight with any of these people. Because you're going to have to make fun of them or something they do. And they're just going to get angry with you because they want to own you. They just want to own you. You know, and I, I, you know, so, and they're not, uh, they're not like evil, malevolent people. They just like anybody want to control you they see you they're like you're a jester i want to i want to own you and i i want you to poke fun at the things i'd like you to poke fun at but i don't want you to say things i'm not comfortable with and that's why it's just funny and i'm like really insignificant compared to the person who told me the story about bezos but when you even the people that i'm kind of friendly with now or in in a I know who they are. They know who I am. And we maybe go to dinner and maybe I see them out and they, 
uh, you know, or they, they have some appreciation for what I do, they like you until you cross a line. And there's always a line. There's always something that you shouldn't say or can't say. And as a comic, you got to make a decision. You go, am I going to be one of the late night guys that goes on stage and reads propaganda that's handed to them five minutes earlier and then they got to like go like, yeah, the Wall Street bets, uh people are Russians. But I'm cha- like, you know, like poor Jimmy Kimmel's got to run out there and go, yeah, <laughs> the Russian disruptors uh, in Wall Street bets. Because it's again, he didn't have that thought. Mm-hmm. Does anyone think Jimmy Kimmel had that thought? I think Jimmy Kimmel came up with that on his way to work. He left his mansion on the way to work. He goes, you know who I bet's doing this? I bet it's Russian disrupt. No, it was handed to him. God only knows how they got into the writer's room. Mm -hmm. There's somebody from the CIA in the writer's room, which isn't hard to do, you know? (laughs) So diversity hire, right out of Langley. (laughs) Here's your new writer, Nawazi Nabobolo. (laughs) Nawazi, where do you come from? Uh, uh, Falls Church, Virginia. Shut up. Don't worry about it. Uh, here's the monologue today. Uh, go out and say they're Russian disruptors. Uh, okay. You know? Uh, here's your new head writer, Gina Haspel. If you get, if you're smarter, you get that. But like that, you get, that's what you got to do. So you got to stay away. That's why now it's my first episode from Texas. I'm in the Hill Country. And nobody's told me, to say, nobody's like, uh, nobody's uh, offended or upset. And it doesn't mean that I don't value what, like I have said on my show, I think Eric Weinstein is an ally and somebody who I agree with. And I think the version of the world he would like is much more similar to my own than the version of the world that his enemies would want. But that doesn't mean I can't make a joke here. I mean, this is absurd and it's just a little crazy, you know? It's a little. It's a little crazy. 